Hello. I'm right here. <laughs> okay. Are you looking for evidence and tools to design and monitor climate actions that build the resilience of communities considering the disproportionate needs and priorities of the most vulnerable groups? You are in the right place. So sit tight for the next 60 minutes and let's glean in from our speakers this gender day. A very good morning from COP28 in Dubai. And a warm welcome to our online audiences, those streaming via the CGIR YouTube page. And welcome to this side event on advancing gender equality and nutrition through climate action and monitoring progress. My name is Viviana Tacos, Engagement, Policy and Advocacy Lead of the CGI Agenda Impact Platform, and I'll be your moderator for this event. For these 60 minutes, we will be presenting frameworks, of course, with the help of uh, experts in the room, and tools that integrate gender and nutrition metrics into climate policies and actions, and also monitoring efforts. We will also highlight results of the subnational level gender and climate change vulnerability hotspot mapping exercise. Um, this was conducted in Kenya, Uganda, uh, and Botswana this 2023. Uh, feel free to engage with us as always via social media, the CGIARX uh, Twitter handle, and also the CGIARGENDA, and use the hashtag gender in AG, and of course, the 28. So we are going to hear two opening statements, one uh, followed by four case study examples of research that have aimed to improve policy design, implementation, and monitoring as our main goal for this session. So first up, allow me to invite Bama Akrea, who is Deputy Assistant Administrator for Gender Equality and Empowerment, Women's Empowerment Hub, and inclusive development at USAID. Bama, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Vivian, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Again, my name is Bama Athreya. I represent the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. And we are so pleased to be here on this day focusing on the importance of gender equality in all of our climate investments. I'm going to start with just a few words about USAID's commitment to gender equity in climate financing and, of course, the importance of rigorous monitoring, uh, the theme of today's session. I think all of us know climate change is not gender neutral. We are here because it's impacting all of our lives. And for those of us who are women, uh, we know that there are disproportionate effects on women and girls. We see increased risk for women and girls, less access to the resources and finance needed to adapt to climate change. And in food systems, we know that women, smallholder producers, and entrepreneurs are the backbone of food systems, with one out of every three employed women working in or adjacent to the agricultural sector around the world. Climate change is therefore critical when we think about our goals of food security. It is undermining our goal of a well-nourished population by stressing the systems that families rely on to access nutritious food, as well as healthcare systems that enable good nutrition. We need to tackle the gender inequities that stand in the way of productivity uh, and food security more than ever to attain prosperous, climate-resilient agriculture and food systems. In support of USAID's climate strategy, our Bureau for Resilience, Environment, and Food Security's Center for Nutrition leads action to increase the access to healthy, diverse, and safe diets in the context of climate change. The center focuses on sustainable production systems in accordance with local ecosystems and contexts, prioritizing diversity, food safety, reduction of food loss, so that safe, nutritious foods are available and affordable for women, children, and families. Beyond nutrition, USAID also implements expansive gender-responsive climate-smart agriculture work. Earlier this year, USAID launched the Generating Resilience and Opportunities for Women, or GROW, a $335 million commitment to elevate gender 
in and through our programs. GROW will tackle urgent challenges facing women that women are facing in food and water systems, including climate change, while unlocking opportunities for women to advance economically, ultimately benefiting, of course, their families, their communities, and their countries. Through GROW, we have, a set, uh, we have set a target of doubling the number of women applying improved farm, uh, on-farm technologies and management practices as a way of driving on-farm change and resilience. USAID has also designed a robust infrastructure of programming to ensure we fulfill our commitments to generating gender responsive climate finance. Echoing GROW's ambition to ensure women's needs are taken into account in sustainable food systems and across our climate programming, we are proud to join with UAE on the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate, AIM for Climate, which encourages governments, the private sector and academia to increase investments in climate smart food systems. In support of the objectives of AIM for Climate and in partnership with CGIAR and smallholder farmers, USAID will help 200 million people in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa raise agricultural productivity by 25% by 2030. Targets will be reached by facilitating the development and dissemination of improved crop varieties, livestock breeds that are resilient to climate change. USAID announced that we have met our $215 million, $215 million uh, aim for climate commitment to CGIAR two years ahead of schedule. In addition, we will commit to invest $100 million to CGIAR over the next two years, subject to the availability of funds. Our Deputy Administrator, Isabel Coleman, made a call to action at the Aim for Climate Summit in May, and this increases our ambition on how investments in agricultural innovation lead to better outcomes for women. We want to celebrate USAID's partners who initiated two new innovation sprints focused on women's empowerment and gender equality, led by CGIAR and the African Women in Agricultural Research and Development Award. These sprints prioritized both generating funds and attention and also creating new partnerships with local and national partners and have leveraged an additional $3.5 million from USAID to bring together over 20 partners and ultimately mobilize over $50 million. Uh, I'm also really pleased to underscore our key part in the new uh, US government-led Women in the Sustainable Economy or WISE initiative, which was launched uh, just last month by US Vice President Harris with a commitment of over 900 million from over 20 private and public sector partners to increase access to jobs, training, leadership opportunities, and finance in the green and blue sectors. The WISE initiative focuses on three pillars, promoting well-paying quality jobs for women in green and blue sectors, supporting women-owned, led, and managed businesses, and eliminating barriers to women's economic participation. There are a number of flagship programs under WISE. I won't have time to outline all of them today, uh, but I do encourage you to look for more information about that initiative. Um, what I will do before turning back over to uh, Vivian and to the panel uh, is to underscore the importance of rigorous data and monitoring, again, the topic of today's session. We know that this is incredibly valuable and we don't just do it in a vacuum. Our partnerships and collaborations, including collaborations with those of you in the room, are really critical to ensure that we are elevating the importance of data that illuminates how important gender equality is to climate adaptation and resilience. We have to be able to show that data. We know it's true, we've seen the data, but others need to see it as well. Um, you may be familiar with the work we've done with IFPRI, uh, our partner under the Gender Climate Change and Nutrition uh, Integration Program, which pioneered the development of the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, in addition to this index, we deeply value our longstanding partnership with IFPRI and, of course, with CGIAR in advancing work that is currently underway to identify a common set of tools we can use and promote across governments and other stakeholders to ensure climate strategies incorporate women and girls and a set of gender-integrated metrics for climate adaptation and mitigation. These will help inform our priorities and ensure that we all are meaningfully addressing the disproportionate impacts of climate change and also promoting solutions that work for women, girls, and for all. Thank you so much for the opportunity to open today's session, and I can't wait to hear the presentations.
Thank you, Bama, for getting us started um, on high notes. Uh, we have another opening statement, and I'd like to invite Purvi Merhu, who is Deputy Director, Agriculture, uh, in charge of Asia at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Vivian, and um, thanks, everyone. I think, uh, first of all, I want to really congratulate and thank Elizabeth and uh, all of you um, for really bringing this integrated topic of gender, nutrition, and climate together. And this is a very interesting way of looking at it in a combined way, not just because they all have uh, some, some persistent uh, challenges that we have been facing in these three areas. But I think the approach of addressing some of these challenges um, need to be combined in all these three. And there are, uh, there are several areas where one sees a lot of need for integrated approach. And uh, because of the similarities of all these three areas that we've been uh, talking about as, uh, as development community, uh, across the world, but for us as the Gates Foundation, uh, you know, as we look at our overall agriculture strategy, which is about uh, uh, sort of including agriculture transformation, all these three topics are equally important to us, right? Uh, and um, these, uh, Brahma, I think you you mentioned about the challenges very well of all these three areas. Um, and, and the reason why the approach has to be common is because there are a lot of areas where, where these three things, uh, there can be a lot of co learning and there can be a common approach. Uh, various reasons. Number one is all these three things, when we look at it, climate, nutrition, gender, these are transdisciplinary areas. So just by having agriculture community work on that, just by increasing, say, for example, agriculture productivity, we are not going to be able to address any of these challenges. Um, I mean, as we know, the agriculture productivity in the world between 2061 to 2015 doubled. Made a lot of difference on Gender, has that made a lot of difference on nutrition? The answer is no. And therefore, I think just by looking at it from an agriculture lens, any of these things will not work. And therefore, the transdisciplinary approach is what is a big common factor for all these, uh, all these three things. The, uh, the second uh, reason why I'm, I'm very excited that these things are combined is all of these things will need impact at scale. We will be able to make any impact only if we we'll put in scale and scalability right from the beginning in any of the approaches that we do. A um, few projects here and there, and now I speak as, as an agriculture scientist, um, you know, isolated stories of success, none of that will work in any of these areas. We've tried this for many, many years, and unless we achieve scale, and scale would mean affordability of the approach that we take, um, taking policy makers along with us and making those large transformative changes Changes, all of that would, uh, would uh, so impact at scale is the second one. The third one is, and I know she can uh, address is that uh, um, uh, in, its, in its program, is all of these three areas, the basic fundamental country level capacities that we are working on is relatively very, very low. And therefore, uh, I think we will we we have to build on that, and we will have to uh, sort of optimize on what capacity there is. And therefore, the need for capacity development. Nobody in this room uh, needs to be told about that. But I don't mean just individual capacities, also institutional capacities. For example, all these three areas, including barring climate a little bit now. Private sector collaboration, for example, is very limited, right? So institutional capacity in any of these three areas is going to be very, very important. And just by saying, well, private sector must invest in gender, I don't think is enough. Uh, what is the incentive for a private sector? 
why why should they see that as a huge opportunity uh, to reach out to such large number of uh, say for example women farmers uh, is you know incentivizing and i think that uh, that is our responsibility to to bring that incentive and that's where some of these data related programs that you all are leading including gcan uh, can bring in some of those data to to uh, to incentivize and to convince uh, those capacities. Uh, the fourth uh, one was, um, uh, you know, it's interesting. We all have been working for this for a very long time. Uh, telling telling uh, of my age, perhaps, but the first time I worked on gender was with IFPRI, and this was uh, 29 years ago. Right? We've been working on this consistently for many, 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 many years. Uh, but we've, we've always seen this as um, an unfelt need among the policymakers, for example. Right? There is a need to change that. And we still do not have enough data um, to, to be able to do that. And I think one of the fundamental data gap I see is not just from a, from a larger policy perspective, but the economic aspect of all these three areas. What are the opportunity costs by not investing as a policymaker in areas like gender, in nutrition, and of course, uh, in climate? So I think, um, you know, these are, uh, these are areas that needs to be seen as an integrated challenge, but these are also areas where it needs to be seen as integrated um, uh, opportunities and common approach to, uh, to address them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Purvi, and of course, welcome back home. <laughs> You had a long uh, career, as you mentioned, within the CG. So I'd like us to move on to the next segment where we are going into expert remarks. And we have four uh, researchers with us. And also, we have three researchers and one policy maker who's a gender negotiator for the team in Kenya. I'd like to invite all, the, all of them on stage, starting with Elizabeth Bryan, who is project leader, IFPRI's Gender, Climate Change and Nutrition Integration Initiative, Jiken. Yes. Oh, okay, fair enough. That's fine. All right. We also have uh, Patricia Bamanyaki, who will come next. Uh, you can just stay so that you can see the slide. Uh, who's Director Strategy and Gender for the Africa Group of Negotiators Expert Support Group, and also a Gender and Climate Policy Researcher with ICRA, which is Accelerating CG Impacts for Climate Change and Resilience, I suppose. We also have Jacqueline Makoha, who is Director, State Department for Gender and Affirmative Action. And finally, we'll have Vivian Pola, who is the Leader, Social and Nutritional Sciences Division. So Elizabeth, let's get started. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and thank you so much for those excellent opening remarks. I'm very excited to hear GCAN get plugged a couple of times. Um, my name is Elizabeth Bryan. I'm a senior scientist at IFPRI, and I lead the Gender, Climate Change, and Nutrition Integration Initiative, or GCAN project for short. Um, oops, sorry, I have the wrong points up here. So. This is a project that we started in 2016 with support from USAID, and the goal was to really support the global food security strategy help to integrate these three areas. And as Pervy mentioned in her remarks, bringing these things together is really, really important for identifying synergies and, and potential trade-offs that we want to avoid. We know that climate change is intensifying, that we already have emissions baked into the system that are going to be affecting us for the next several decades. These are going to have serious implications for uh, gender equality as well as nutrition. One of the first things that we did um, when we received this project was to develop a conceptual framework to really help us understand what are the linkages between gender, climate, and nutrition. And we drew on the literature 
also to kind of see how these things came together, there wasn't a lot of work already going on at that time that covered all three areas. And so we had to pull from several different bodies of literature to put this together. And you can see, we've been able to highlight where is, what are the relationships between gender, climate, and nutrition? We know that women tend to be more vulnerable to climate shocks and stressors. They also have less resilience capacity to be able to respond and to lead decisions about how people and households and communities are responding to the climate challenges that they face. This means that the response choices that are often chosen um, tend not to be ones that might better benefit uh, or support women's empowerment. And this results in gender inequality as well as other outcomes. And in terms of nutrition, we all consider nutrition as a consequence of climate change. So climate change will affect nutrition through changes in availability, in access, in the quality of foods, even the nutritional content of the of crops that are consumed. But nutrition is also important resilience capacity as well. It affects people's ability to provide labor in agriculture, to perform their work successfully and engage in their livelihoods. And response options also have implications for nutritional outcomes. So there's important linkages there as well. So we're really, really delighted that we were have received additional funding to support the GCAN project from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, this will involve work over four years, um, focused in a set of countries um, to really work on strengthening the ability of stakeholders within these countries, including policymakers, um, research organizations, and others to better integrate gender and nutrition in climate policies and climate programming, and especially this monitoring aspect and the implementation piece. So why do we wanna focus on policy processes and integrating gender and nutrition into these? We've seen some progress in terms of the policy design side. So we see gender is being written into policies like the NAPS and the NDCs more. Nutrition maybe to a lesser extent, but we're starting to see some of these goals written there. Yet when it comes to actual implementation and then monitoring the outcomes of these policies, we're, we're really missing a lot there. And so we wanna work with partners to better think about what are the indicators, what are the metrics that are needed um, to better integrate gender and nutrition in climate policies and coordinate across many, many different organizations in a complex landscape um, that's working on developing these monitoring systems. So we are taking a phased process to roll out this work in the five countries. And the five countries are India, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, and Senegal. We started this work in Kenya, and we have yet to roll it out into the other countries. But we have want to do this through several steps. First, because we want this to be demand-driven. We want to work with stakeholders, with policymakers, to understand what their needs are in that particular context. Some countries are very um, decentralized, so we're also talking to counties or states, depending on where we're working, to try and understand what the needs are to strengthen the monitoring efforts um, in those areas. The first thing we did to really understand what is the landscape that we're, that we're coming into and what is the landscape that we're dealing with is to do a participatory um, institutional mapping exercise with local experts and policymakers at these different scales. So in Kenya, we worked at the national level and we used a net map tool to map the, the landscape of actors who are working on climate monitoring and implementation. We also invited several counties to join us to understand how things work at the county level. Okay, and I'm, I'm short on time, so I'm gonna have to speed up here. Um, <clears throat> We got a lot of lessons and initial feedback from the participants in these workshops that will help us as we go forward. One is that it's clear that gender and nutrition are, are not fully integrated there. Even taking a step back from that, there's a lack of coordination among multiple agencies and stakeholders who are involved in mainstreaming climate and gender to some extent, but these things are not integrated. Um, 
there is a lack of coordination between the national and the, the local level. So there's a lot of work that we can do to work with different partners to help mainstream gender and nutrition in these ministries and to help hopefully facilitate better coordination across. We also plan to adapt a tool that was developed by another initiative called the um, Gender Equality Initiative or HER Plus, um, which is a tool that really is innovative in that it's going beyond the traditional measures of measuring women's leadership and agency and policy processes to look at things like to what extent are women actually leading the process? Are they influencing that process? Um, it looks at indicators like gender responsive budgeting or staffing. Um, and so it's going beyond and it's looking beyond the design phase to also policy implementation and planning. So we wanna take this tool, which has already been piloted in Nigeria and India and try to adapt some of these indicators for our purposes as well as building in that nutrition lens so that we can really capture all three areas when we work with, our, with these countries. So what's next? We have a, a lot of work still to do in Kenya, which is the country we're starting with, and also to roll this out then to the additional countries that we'll be working in. Uh, we plan to do a capacity needs assessment with some of the key stakeholders who are identified through the institutional mapping process. Um, we also will conduct a situation analysis looking at data that's available on gender, climate, and nutrition. And we plan to continue to engage and provide technical assistance with the partners based on the capacity needs that they identify and, and working within the, the system and, and given the demands of policymakers there. And we hope to also engage in multi-stakeholder platforms. And so I would really encourage any of you who are working in these five countries on this area of really integrating gender, climate, and nutrition to please approach me. And I, we would love to reach out to you and hear about what you're working on and see how we might be able to work together and, and plug into some of the, the efforts that you have ongoing. And so I will stop there and thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. I had already invited, uh, uh, introduced all four of them. So I'll just call on Patricia, take us through research for effective policy and program design using hotspot mapping. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Vivian, for that uh, introduction. Uh, yes, what I'll be talking about uh, today is the importance of research for effective policy and program design, and specifically uh, looking at hotspot mapping, gender and climate change vulnerability hotspot mapping as a decision support tool to uh, enhance this process. So I will start immediately by talking about the rationale or the justification. Why should we be considering gender hotspot mapping? Um, and we find that uh, just like the previous presenter has just mentioned, we know that women, men use different, the intersectionality of persons experience differently climate change impacts and their vulnerability is also uh, different due to differences in the roles, responsibilities, uh, resources and services that they have access to as well as the agency they have to take decisions uh, to help them adapt. We also know that gender, there are vast studies that have been conducted on vulnerability assessments but when you look at uh, even from peer-reviewed research, you find that gender is either often excluded or if it is used or if it is considered, it is mainly used as just a variable to, uh, to compare differences in distributions to how people are affected, but not necessarily studying how the underlying causes of those differences. So. Uh, there is justification to have more research that is gender that is gender specific for us to be able to uh, understand these details. Then we also see that the integration of gender equality to national climate policy and climate action has also been slow. And uh, 
Even the UNFCCC recognizes that sex disaggregated data is still a problem in many of our countries. And we also know that, uh, I'll say particularly like for Africa, we have few countries that have uh, gender responsive climate policies. Some are yet to integrate gender into the existing climate policies they have, while others have to develop them from scratch. So this is a tool that can help uh, this. And another issue that we see is that, uh, especially when, for instance, disasters, climate-induced natural disasters happen, we find that many of our governments take maybe a one-size-fits-all approach, which I will explain as, uh, for instance, if a drought has happened in a place, and then seeds are distributed on a ration basis, not taking into consideration the different levels or stages at which people are at in terms of their capabilities to adapt. So you find that resources are wasted um, or inefficiently used because you find those who are much better off also benefiting from such programs at the expense of those who are much worse off. So at the end of it all, you find that even after such interventions, there are still gaps and the vulnerable are still worse off. Then we also find that as uh, the push for transformative approaches continues to gain ground across different sectors, we also note that we need an evidence base for this to happen. And we cannot do that unless we have a strong decision support tools that facilitate this process. And so specific to the agriculture sector, because now we are talking about gender equality, advancing gender equality and nutrition, it is important for us to have such a tool that helps us increase, first of all, identify where gaps are and increase women and girls' capabilities and opportunities for climate action in agriculture and allied sectors. And lastly, like I already mentioned, there is need for the implementation and implementation of the gender action plan that we have here at UNFCCC at national level. And we can only do that if we uh, are able, first of all, to understand where are we at at national level before we come up with uh, appropriate interventions or approaches that we need to invest in for us to move forward and domesticate our action plans. So having given the justification why we need gender hotspot, gender and climate change hotspot mapping, I'll give a brief background of where it is, uh, where we came from, the background, and specifically in Africa, because uh, like I was introduced, I work with the African Group of Negotiators Expert Support, which is a continental think tank that focuses mainly on the Africa continent. So um, in 2020, there was a continental level gender hotspot mapping study in Africa, uh, which later cascaded to granular level because much as it identified the countries, it was not sufficient enough to guide gender responsive interventions in the NDCs and the NAPs. So progress to date, we are now uh, expanded to three countries, like Vivian mentioned. We are now, in 2023, we've conducted this study in Botswana, Kenya, and Uganda, and we are covering three economic sectors, and we are focusing on agriculture, water, and energy in Uganda and Kenya. And for Botswana, it's agriculture, water, and tourism. And the main goal is to generate reliable and applicable sex disaggregated subnational level data to inform the gender responsive decision making in climate policy and action by various stakeholders. And these are both in government and also outside government. And the study methodology has two. Two distinct phases, the first one being hotspot mapping and the next one being ground truthing. Because of time, I'll just quickly uh, run through this. So phase one, which is uh, mainly a secondary data phase, uh, we 
which involves identification of the sectors, then we constitute national technical teams because we find it necessary uh, to work together with government since you want uh, this process or the outputs of this process to inform policy making. It's important for you to work with government and not outside. And we constitute teams that are members of the representatives of these sectors that we are working with, for instance, the ministries, departments, and agencies of the agriculture, tourism, uh, water, energy, we are part of these teams. So we utilize official statistics mainly because governments plan on the basis of their official data, but we also expand it to other data as long as it is at subnational level and sex disaggregated. So um, then we generate hotspot maps and move to the next phase, which is ground truthing. And it has two key objectives. One, since we use secondary data and we know sometimes the secondary data has issues, we need to validate whether the hotspots that are being shown are actually hotspots. And on the basis of ascertaining that they are hotspots, then our second objective is to now investigate further to understand the nature and extent of vulnerability. First of all, identify who are the most vulnerable within these hotspots, and then what is the nature and extent of their vulnerability. And then um, we use various methods, but underscoring participatory action research and uh, with gender through gender analysis, uh, we conduct gender analysis on those specific areas that you can see. And with that data, we, we will be prepared, of course, technical reports and engage stakeholders with the results. And the, the, what I'll also mention is that what is generated is an interactive hotspot map, which is not static. And as you hover over it, it's able to tell you for each district what is the vulnerability index of the district because they are ranked. And that helps you now prioritize. So. I'll conclude by saying three things that underscore the importance of this as a decision support tool. One being that even that it highlights differences between districts in the country, it allows us to do policy and program design that targets local risks and specific context. Then it also allows us the further examination of gender issues, like I mentioned, in specific sectors and for specific populations. and. Uh, as we design adaptation options, they are no longer now uh, gender blind, and they are also no longer a one size fits all, that, which I'll have this approach for every drought prone area, but rather it will be specific to what was found in specific locations. And then uh, this special priority setting and targeting in policy and program design, is also useful because like our theme suggests today, we are also interested in monitoring and evaluation. So this provides us with a good basis for a baseline uh, because there are indicators that are generated out of this process, uh, which can now be used to uh, continue to measure and track progress and monitor and evaluate the success of interventions to address climate action. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know you had a lot to share in seven minutes. So Jacqueline will build up from where Patricia left by just highlighting a couple of lessons from the Kenyan hotspot map uh, exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. And um, it, it didn't help that I sat there and saw how you're harassing people. So. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I'll just follow up from where Patricia has left, and especially mentioning that uh, for the Kenyan case, we, we have done the secondary data uh, collection and analysis. I, I don't have a presentation, so you can just look at the beautiful photo, but listen to me. Yeah, so we, we are yet to do the ground truthing. Which, which is the final stage before we do the, the, the reporting and the final 
the hotspot maps, but we have some preliminary findings. And the Kenyan uh, case, we were um, focusing on agriculture, energy, and water as, as uh, some of the key uh, climate vulnerable sectors. But for purposes of this discussion, I think I'll, I'll uh, limit myself to agriculture, although we, you know, we recognize again that water and energy are very key drivers of the uh, agriculture sector. So it, it is worth mentioning them. So uh, in terms of the, the, the findings uh, so far, um, and, and we were looking at different parameters within the agriculture sector. So for instance, um, uh, in, in Kenya and in Africa at large, we know that, uh, for instance, women are, are largely engaged in the agriculture sector when you look at the percentage of um, the, the labor force in the agriculture sector is female dominated. Yet we have to look at the other parameters. Like for instance, in our, in coming up with our hotspots, we were looking at like the issues of um, access um, and, and utilization of resources. In agriculture sector, you're looking at issues around land. So like in the Kenyan context, of course, um, uh, general statistics uh, show that uh, women uh, own very uh, minimal land resources uh, compared to men. But again, there's a challenge uh, in terms of those uh, statistics because they, it's, it's very hard for, for you to get um, very true statistics from the institutions vested with the mandate of uh, land registration. There are currently efforts um, underway to, to try and disaggregate um, data in terms of land registration. But we are not there yet in terms of just having the whole of, of land as you know agricultural land for this matter um, you know, to tell exactly how much is owned by women and how much is uh, owned by men. Then now that affects uh, uh, women in terms of uh, you know what they gain out of this uh, agricultural. Um, activities and, and also at, uh, affecting issues around um, uh, nutrition, especially if they are not able to make decisions as to how uh, but, you know, they, they utilize the land at their disposal. There's also issues of uh, technology. I know we talk about um, climate smart agriculture and, and, and um, you know, uh, various agricultural inputs. So when we look at technology, like um, one of the parameters we were looking at as we, we were looking into uh, issues of uh, vulnerability in the agricultural sector, we found that when it comes to access to technology, again, uh, there are disparities as to uh, the issue of accessibility to appropriate technologies by women as compared to to men, and therefore, when there is a particular technology uh, being advanced uh, by various stakeholders, there is that variation that you, the, the reach will not be um, as as huge as the you know intended because of that limitation. Issues of um, low literacy levels um, amongst women, and, and and also just the issue of accessing that technology. Uh, of women not having resources to even buy, like, let's say, a phone, because they, like, when it comes to, um, like, for instance, say, early warning systems, you'll find that sometimes it's done through SMS alerts. And so, if one, um, the women are illiterate, or they don't even own the phones or the technology being utilized, and that's a uh, in, in a sense means that they, they lose out on this um, information. So for us, the, the hotspot uh, mapping is very critical at policy level, to, you know, to, to look into uh, policy interventions that uh, take care of the, the glaring disparities that um, exist. So the, the need for tailored uh, intervention mechanisms um, um, capacity building programs for for women. Of course, uh, again, being someone from the ministry responsible for gender, I, you know, it's 
it's always been a rallying call for me that uh, you can't be serious. <laughs> So, so uh, climate change affects both men and women. That, that's a given because they, I, I think even as we talk now, some areas, some parts of Kenya are experiencing flooding. And when it floods in, in an area, of course, both men and women are affected. And then, of course, again, we appreciate that because of the gender roles, the vulnerability for women um, is, is more uh, uh, as of that, uh, of that uh, as of, as, of men and and therefore when we are coming up with policy uh, decisions it doesn't mean that men are left out it just means that the interventions um, geared towards men and women should be targeted in a way that they, they they speak to their their needs and not that any gender is left out so it's important for us uh, even in terms of budgeting i think uh, one of the uh, as presenters mentioned about a gender responsive budgeting, I think that is also one of the areas that, you know, they, they, it's very slow in terms of progress. For the case of Kenya, we even have national guidelines, but then the implementation is, is very slow and gradual. So again, issues of capacity building, even for policy makers with the, across institutions to ensure that um, you know, able to address uh, the, you know, these vulnerabilities in a targeted way, but of course informed by by data. Um, so there is also the uh, just across the sectors in during our study. Thank you. I'm concluding. Uh, I think it's just worth mentioning. And since I'm talking to researchers, I think uh, amongst the presenters, I'm the only non-researcher. I'm a researcher wannabe. So. <laughs> Um, I think the, the gaps in data are really glaring. Even as we talk about secondary data, our national institutions are not at the level where they've disaggregated data in a way that it's easy to capture and analyze. So these are areas that we should really put emphasis on. I think build capacity even of our um, national data institutions to, to really be able to capture data in a way that is um, uh, easy for anyone to to get that data and uh, analyze it for relevant policies and yeah just welcoming partnerships as we go along thank you thank you jacqueline though you kept on denying about my time but all good <laughs> um let's hear then from my namesake vivian for the final presentation Seven minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian, for emphasizing the seven minutes. I'll try to go fast. And I'm Vivian Polar, Gender and Innovation Senior Scientist at the International Potato and Acting Lead of the uh, Social and Nutritional Sciences Division. So talking about gender and nutrition sensitive meeting for climate um, resilience, we actually are going to present an experience working in uh, sweet potato when analyzing gender, climate, and nutrition, all three combined together. Can we go to the next? Uh, do we have a... Um, changing, do we have... Can we go to the next? Is there a chip? So the, going into the specific example, some of the key priorities for sweet potato breeding were around nutrition specifically, talking about vitamin A biofortification. And there were other issues around climate change adaptation that were embedded in the breeding program, including heat stress tolerance, drought tolerance, and enabling fast growth of the root and some disease resistance that had to be um, tackled in order to address climate change uh, issues. And what about gender? Gender come into play when we talk about uh, developing a new variety. So we did this, can we go to the next? Through a step-by-step, -step, through a step-by-step -step, uh, process. And this process including first looking at the market segmentation. Are we breeding? What is the new variety going to uh, address for this specific market segment. Taking that piece of the discussion 
to the drawing board with the breeders, discussing with them this market segment aligns with the pipelines and the specific lab and field experiments that they were doing. Um, taking that and discussion process into developing pipeline investment cases. What is the potential impact of these um, technologies that are being developed on poverty? And what is the potential impact on nutrition? And finally, what is the potential impact on gender out of this recipe of breeding being developed? Within this step-by-step -step process, we have um, two key areas, two key entry points of gender analysis. One at the very beginning where the market segmentation is uh, developed to understand who the people are, and this connects really well with the, with the hotspots. Um, and then the final piece where the um, interaction happens is once that recipe for breeding is already outlined, to see what are the potential positive and negative implications of that. So to address the, the gender analysis at the very beginning of the market segmentation process, we looked at the segmenting and targeting through a gender lens, understanding where women are in this segment, who they are, what are the challenges they face, and then the dimension of this segment and how we can actually implement it using um, what we call the uh, G plus tools for customer profiling. And then at the end, once that recipe or that blueprint of the breeding was designed, we look at it from the perspective of now to this recipe of a new variety. What are the positive implications, positive benefits on gender, and what are um, the possible trade-offs? Um, what are the do-no-harm elements that we need to uh, consider within that, within that blueprint or recipe of a new variety? Some of the issues we analyzed within this great uh, descriptor were what are the implications on, for example, issues of um, inputs of unequal access? Does this blueprint of a variety, for example, require us to use inputs that women will not be able to access? What are the implications of drudgery? What are the elements of gender gap that are connected to this new blueprint? We need to know if this new variety, if this blueprint of the technology will have positive, negative implications. So, pilot worked around that and we had some very interesting findings. We then taken off to the field and discussed with farmers, also with um, with some decision makers and breeders and expert consultation, we found that some of the, the preferred traits around usually quality traits connected to cooking time, to the taste of the product, uh, to the texture, to the shape, to the even feel and multiple others, were essentially being highlighted by women. Not only for women uh, that were using it at home for home consumption, but because many processors and smallholder process uh, um, in a simple way, are selling it out on the street, they're using it for processing. So it is that input that needs to be captured when designing this blueprint. One other issue we found, which is really interesting on the do no harm findings, is that while we strive for developing short cycle varieties, we found that in the case of women, it was highlighted that early maturing might be a trait to reconsider, or in some cases maybe, because when it was short cycle variety, it was usually men who were taking over the selling process, harvesting really quick and getting it up to the market, well, and women were left without any to cook at home or to do their home processing. Mm -hmm. So it is something for the team to take to the drawing board and rethink, do we really and who are we benefiting when we develop these short cycle varieties? So it becomes really evident why it is so important to conduct gender analysis. Before Vivian, oh, there we go. So now what? I'm in the final slide. So now what? So I'm going to pick up on some of the issues highlighted by our um, one of our keynote speakers who talked about uh, 
scaling. She talked about um, ensuring the institutional issue is addressed, and that's precisely where we go. We need to understand that we need a systematic process of addressing um, this type of analysis. It shouldn't be a one-off base, a one-off example of something that can be done. It should be addressed well, all of the blueprints, variety, or any other technology that is designed. Right? We need to look at it systematically. What is this technology doing in the field in terms of climate change, in terms of gender? What are the negative and positive implications so that we can scale the process? Close up data gaps because there are huge data gaps, as one of the previous speakers highlighted, and make the connection point between multiple streams of data being collected out there. For example, with the hotspots, we can make a bridge. With the women's empowerment in agriculture, let's see how we can make that connection and close the gap. And finally, uh, reshaping the institutions so that these processes are embedded permanently in the way we analyze technology. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Vivian, for telling us more about gender, breeding, and nutrition. Uh, we have already reached our time allocated for this session, so I'll invite you to interact with any of our speakers. Um, any of our speakers as soon as the event is over. But for now, we just have three more minutes for a final closing remark from Dr. Nicolene Dehan, who is the director of the CGI Agenda Impact Platform. Thanks, and I'll try to keep it uh, to less than three minutes. Um, so first of all, thanks to all the uh, speakers. I'm always amazed at all the research that's ongoing and all the connections that can be laid as well. And so I wanted to highlight basically four connections that I think I heard. Um, one was transdisciplinarity, but also trade-offs in that. How do we actually work with, you know, the different demands? And how do we work with moving that forward? And I wanted to put something out there. We always talk about food transformation. And we're working on food transformation, food system transformation. Where do we want it to transform to? And I think that's something that we haven't really thought through. And I, I, I please uh, put out a plea to everybody in this room, think about what you want in your food system. And maybe then we can start working backwards almost or figuring out where we want to go because I don't think we have a real vision. We all talk about equitable, sustainable, but what does that really mean? And what are those trade-offs between those uh, different parts? So that's one. The other one I think is very interesting and very important and also one of the reasons we engaged on the, on the hot spot, but even things that, that Vivian is doing, targeting. We don't have enough time to do everything. Huh? So let's start targeting, targeting where we know it works and really fix it and do that, not do everything around the world. We won't fix everything, but figure out. We have enough data and enough understanding to figure out how to target. Data gaps, we always talk about data gaps, so I'm glad to hear it was out there again. We still do have data gaps, unfortunately, and we will continue to having. So let's also figure out how we can combine, you know, some of that transdisciplinarity. Where, what data do we need? We don't need everything data. It reminds me very clearly when, you know, we go to farmers and we have hours and hours of surveys. We probably didn't need half of that information. So let's also start figuring out what data we really need and really work towards getting that data. And the last but uh, not least, engaging. I love the fact that everybody did talk about at some level, how do we engage? How do we engage with everybody? How do we uh, make sure that we get everybody's voice? Uh, uh, Elizabeth was talking about that. But also in that sense, which I thought was interesting too and very important, how do we build that capacity to engage? I mean, telling somebody something is not going to work unless they have the capacity to also understand it and use it and build something out of that. So I think for me, this was a nice session. It brought several despairing, not despairing, how do you call it, several different pieces together. It shows again that we have all the pieces. We just need to start working at bringing it all together. So thanks again for everyone. And please do reach out to our, our, our speakers if you have any questions or any follow-ups with them. Thanks. I'm, I'm I'm looking at my at my 
<laughs> they seem like they want more. Should we continue from the room? Anyway, uh, so thank you so much for being in the room. Um, okay. Um, you need a microphone, so. Introduce yourself uh, and. My name is uh, Dr. Fatima Al Hassan Al Tahir. I am the National Convener for Food System in Sudan. I'm the Secretary General of Food uh, Security and Nutrition. Uh, first of all, I think uh, women, mainly women, they are the start point of nutrition, starting from breastfeeding. Uh, no, uh, we know uh, what kind of materials or what kind of uh, food, nutritious food that they can support their children. Uh, even in Sudan, women, they work in uh, home gardens. They secure the household for security for all the family. So linking uh, nutrition, climate change, and uh, gender equality, I think it is a very good topic to be addressed. But uh, I think the engagement of uh, gender policies and strategies in climate uh, policies is a, a roadmap for and, uh, advancing this, uh, these three pillars and also engagement of uh, climate uh, policies in all national policies, or even uh, regional policies uh, is, is very important. Uh, disaggregated data is needed. Because uh, if I, I talk as EGAD uh, region, uh, we have a problem in the disaggregated data, and uh, it is a general data. So you cannot uh, know the context and the specific need for women and men. I think uh, we need support from uh, SEGR uh, in this issue, capacity building, information, and the grouping of women. If we make cooperatives or association for women, you can support them with all the services that they need uh, to to uh, need to uh, to be aware of climate problems, climate mechanics, and how they can do their work during these uh, issues. Finance is very important for these three pillars mm -hmm. to advance uh, to advance them. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Indeed, finance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My name is Ruth Spence. I'm from Antigua and Barbuda, Caribbean island. And the term climate change, I think we need to break it down because we have to localize it. You're working with people. For me, I work with many groups. But the greatest harm to women, their health is from chemicals and pollution. I don't, I haven't heard nobody touch it. We also suffer from drought. So when I'm writing a project, I need to know what is the real impact of climate change. I can't just keep saying climate change. But that chemical and pollution, that's harming the people. It's harming the soil. It's causing degradation. So we have to know building synergies about conventions because I can't talk about improving women when it's the chemicals that they're using. So as a CSO, I have to take on new roles and responsibilities. I have to build my capacities in other areas. And the thing you mentioned about like peer processes, you know, like climate doesn't talk to biodiversity. Those things exist, but as a CSO, I have to connect with these people wherever the problems are. So looking forward, we have to have a wider focus. We have to pinpoint the problem to really be able to help these women and their children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those excellent remarks. <laughs> Let's continue the interaction uh, as we have to close the session. I'd also like to thank all the speakers from the keynote to the experts and also contributions from the floor and to invite all speakers for a photo right now. Thank you to the rest of you. This conversation continues at the Kenya Pavilion in another 40 minutes. Jacqueline is going to showcase the Kenyan maps. Nicolene is also on the panel. You're welcome. 40 minutes. <laughs>